Well, welcome back to the fellowship. All of our friends, our family that join in each week to our online gathering. So glad you're here. Today, we're going to be celebrating a birthday. We're going to explore one of the greatest days in history. It's the birth of the church. The fellowship is one expression of thousands, and we are excited that you're here worshiping together today. And now we get to go and turn our attention to the teaching of the Word of God. So grab your Bible, a way to take notes, as we dive into the amazing pages of the Word of God, the Bible. We're going to be in the New Testament book of Acts today, chapter 2, so welcome in. Well, the date was March the 6th, 1994. It was a Sunday morning, and I was serving as a student pastor and music pastor at a church in Jacksonville, Florida. It was the first church I'd ever served uh, full-time at. And on that morning, everything seemed somewhat normal until I saw Darlene, and she looked at me and she said, I think we're going to have a baby today. And it was on that day that God gave us our firstborn child. Beautiful little girl. We were so excited. I, some of you will remember, uh, we're going to put the picture up for all of you that are watching online. You'll see the picture as well. Uh, these little bubblegum cigars. I had a couple of boxes of those little pink ones. And I was passing them out to everybody because I was so excited. We had a baby girl and I just, I can't tell you the flood of emotions. And if you've ever had a child, you probably can resonate with how I felt. I was so excited that we had um, our first child and she was just beautiful. Well, today I want to take you back 2,000 years ago to a birth day. It was the day the church was born. It's called the day of Pentecost. And I actually had planned on preaching this sermon a week ago, but because we had some guests in town from Peru, uh, it changed my schedule a little bit because last Sunday was actually uh, Pentecost Sunday. And so uh, I wanted to preach this sermon on that day, but it's okay. I'm going to preach it today. Uh, we just got done. Many of you may have celebrated Pentecost Sunday last Sunday. But we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today that I just think is fascinating. It's Acts chapter 2. You know, to get us started today, I want to, I want to tell you a little story. I don't know if you heard about the three guys that were in the waiting room up in Minneapolis. Uh, three young men, and they were so excited. Their wives were all going to have children, so they had this in common, and they're all at the hospital. They had never met each other before until this, and so the three of these men are waiting anxiously. When the doctor abruptly comes through the doors, and he looks at the first guy, and he says, hey, um, Mr. Moore, I just got to tell you, I have had the privilege of delivering your first little baby, but it was more than one. You had twins, and the dad was so excited, man. He was jumping up for joy. He's high-fiving the other guys. We've had twins, and he said, you know what's really incredible about this is I play for the Minnesota Twins. I'm a baseball player, so how ironic that we've had twins, and I play for the twins, and so everybody was all excited in the waiting room, but the other two guys are sitting nervously. They're waiting the news of their children being born, and then the doctor abruptly comes through the door again. And he looks at the next gentleman and he says, hey, Mr. Nix, I just got to tell you, I want to be the first to celebrate with you. Your wife just delivered three healthy babies. You had triplets today and everybody is high-fiving and uh, the Twins baseball player is all excited for them. And so he's pumped and he goes, you know, that's really ironic. That guy had twins. Uh, he plays for the Twins. I work for a company. I'm an executive for a company called 3M. And at that point, you just hear a thud over in the corner because the third guy that's waiting on his wife, he's sitting there while everyone else is all excited, and he, he looks really nervous, like he might pass out. And a nurse rushes over and says, uh, sir, are you okay? And he says, yes, I'm okay. But man, they had twins, they've had triplets. He works for the twins, he works for 3M. I work for a company called 7UP. Hope you get it. It's a great joke. Uh, listen, the story we're going to look at today, it wasn't two that were born or three that were born. There were 3,000 born on one day, the day of Pentecost. Here we go, 
Acts chapter 2, hope you love my humor here today. Here we go. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Some translations say they were meeting in one accord in one place, not a Honda accord, but in one accord in one place. So they're all meeting together. All the believers are unified. These are the believers that had been with Jesus since the resurrection. There's 120 of them. They've made their way over into Jerusalem. They're in the upper room, and there they're meeting, and they have got a new boldness. There is an excitement about them because they're ready to go and tell everybody that Jesus is alive, but Jesus has told them, I need you to just wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. So they've been waiting, and I can just tell you, because of the resurrection, their lives have been altered for the rest of their life. I mean, they, this has completely changed them. And so they've got this new boldness, and now on the day of Pentecost, it's going to happen. Now, l- l- let me describe a little bit about Pentecost, because we read that on the day of Pentecost, so that we're all um, thinking the same way, understanding maybe the the timeline of Pentecost. Pentecost is, it's actually one of three major festivals on the Jewish calendar. And uh, three times a year, the Jewish men would come together to Jerusalem. They'd go to the temple and, uh, and that's where they would meet with God. And on this particular Pentecost, uh, they would have gone and there would have been a priest there and they would do something a little unusual because Pentecost is always seven Sabbaths plus one day, or seven weeks, if you will, plus one day, that means 50. Pentecost means 50 or 50th. So it would be 50 days from the Passover. If you'll remember, when Jesus was crucified, they were going into Passover week. And, uh, and, and it started on that weekend, and then on the resurrection day, from that day forward, there were 40 days Jesus was with his followers, they all believe, and now it's been 10 days since Jesus has ascended back to heaven, and it's the day of Pentecost. And on this day, on the Jewish calendar, the priest would come into the temple and they would wave what's called a sheaf offering. It's a sheaf of barley, and they would wave that as um, a, a sense of gratitude, saying, God, thank you for the spring harvest. So 50 days from Passover the priest would wave the sheaf offering. Um, And and so Pentecost is an interesting time. Sometimes when you're reading about this in the Old Testament, because it was established in the Old Testament, you'll find this labeled as the Feast of Weeks. Uh, You'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 16. You'll find it in Leviticus chapter 23. The Feast of Weeks is seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, from Passover, remember Passover is from the moment when God released the Israelites from the um, from bondage in Egypt, and b- they began their journey as a new nation on their own. Well, they celebrated the Passover every single year. Seven weeks from that, seven Sabbaths from that, plus one day, that's 50 days, would be the day of Pentecost, and so they would come together on that day. Now, Pentecost is for believers, and so the first fruits of the church, this Pentecost, when the, birth, the, the church is born, the birth of the church, it's going to be a display of the first fruits of the church on this particular day, Pentecost Day. So 50 days from resurrection, resurrection Sunday, 50 days, the birth of the church takes place And this is an exciting moment in history. It is a new adventure for these followers. Um, They're going to experience things they've never experienced before. Uh, They had anticipated their grandparents, their great-grandparents. I mean, they had anticipated every single generation had been anticipating the coming Messiah. And these folks got to see the Messiah. They got to see him up close and in person, walk with him, talk with him. They saw him die on the cross. They saw him resurrect. uh, And then 10 days they spent, or excuse me, 40 days they spent with him. And then he ascends back to heaven and now they've been waiting. So this excitement is building, man. They are so excited. And I I just want to say, I hope you are excited about what God's doing in your life. I hope you are like like me. In my prayer journal, I'm praying all the time, God, Whatever it is you have for David, whatever it is you have for my family, for my marriage, whatever you have for our church, 
God, would you allow me to be willing to adjust and just align myself with whatever that activity is? And I find this an exciting journey. I hope you find following Christ an exciting journey. That's where these folks were. Now they're in the upper room going, okay, what do we do now? And now it is the day of Pentecost. And and I hope and my prayer for you is that you too would find that new adventures and and the way that God uh, blesses his people and gifts his people, God gives gifts to us through his spirit that you would find this adventure and you would find yourself desiring to be on this adventure with God in a great way. So uh, let me just say, before I go too far in this passage, I think this is a good place for me to just mention here. I think that you, because you're a part of the fellowship family, I think you might be in a little bit of a dilemma when it comes to this particular passage and the way we approach it. So you go, okay, pastor, what does that mean? We're in a little bit of a dilemma. Well, you got to understand that you are in a church that does believe in the filling of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I believe in it. I teach it from the platform. I believe it's in Scripture. I believe that God honors that. So I believe in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in this community. But you're going to come across people that are going to go, oh, you go to that church, you must be a part of that crazy church down there that believes in the filling of the Holy Spirit. You're one of those wild people, and you're going to be like, okay, I don't feel like I'm one of those wild, crazy people. I've been attending the fellowship. I don't see anything wild and crazy about this, um, because we do believe that everything should be done decently and in order. We believe that there is structure in the New Testament church, so then that, that creates a little bit of a dilemma because then there'll be those on the other side. Man, they are, they are those folks that are running around in church. They seem like they're crazy. Um, maybe they're shouting or laughing all the time. Maybe they're falling down and passing out for an extended period of time. And they could look at you and go, oh, you go to that church. You must just be dead in your works with Christ because I don't see the feeling of the Holy Ghost in you. So you've got a little bit of a dilemma here because I'm going to use a key word here. I believe here at the fellowship, we have balance here. I believe in the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I believe it is taught in Scripture. I believe it is good for today. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to stir and move and use. I believe the Holy Spirit gives gifts for today. But at the same time, there is organization to this organism called the church And that's what we believe in. That's the balance we bring. So you might find yourself in a little bit of a dilemma when it comes to this particular passage. So I want to walk with us and uh, and make sure that we all get it. So here we go again, uh, back to verse 1. We already started into it. Let me just refresh your memory. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So they're all unified together in one room. Verse 2, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. So on the day of Pentecost, let's, let's, let's press pause and make sure we're all thinking the same way here. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days from resurrection, the church is going to be born. It's been 10 days since Jesus left them and ascended back to heaven. And on this day, Pentecost Day, they are going to experience three phenomena they've never seen before, never heard before. Uh, They're going to have an audible phenomena, there's going to be a visual phenomena, and there's going to be an oral phenomena. Now, let's walk through this passage together to make sure we get it. So in these first three verses here, uh, we see this audible phenomena. They hear something that is like this roaring, uh, this rushing wind, this mighty wind. And notice what the scripture said. It was like the sound of this. So he's not, listen, Luke is not describing the weather conditions in in, uh, Jerusalem. He's not like, oh yeah, it it was a really windy day in Jerusalem. No, this was an unusual phenomena. This is a moment that they've not heard anything like this. You ever been around somebody that's lived through a tornado 
and you say, well, what did it sound like? You remember what they say. You've heard it before. It sounded like a train was coming. I I remember in 2004, I was serving as a family pastor at a church. We were living in Martin County, Florida. That's down between Port St. Lucie and uh, West Palm Beach down on the eastern coast of Florida. And uh, in 2004, we got hit by a couple of hurricanes. But I remember during Hurricane Francis, we had sustained winds of 145 miles an hour. And we opened up our church and everybody gathered together in the church for safety. uh, And the church, it was hurricane, the, the building was hurricane rated. In the middle of this storm, when the eye came over our church, over our area, me and a few buddies of mine, we went outside and it was, it was so calm. It was peaceful. You could look up, you could see stars in the sky. I mean, you would never know that a storm had just torn through our area. It was so nice and calm. And we walked around the side of the building and you could hear, you could almost feel what was coming. It was the eye wall was about to hit. You could hear it coming. There was a rumble about it. That's what I picture. I picture that's what these 120, they're in the upper room. They've been waiting for 10 days. And now all of a sudden they hear this audible phenomena. It's this rushing wind, this this mighty force of wind that they hear. Here it comes. Now, you might go, well, what's the significance of this sound that they hear. Well, in Scripture, you'll find a number of times where God, His voice is heard audibly in some kind of a wind. God spoke to Job one time. In the midst of a whirlwind, he could hear the voice of God. There was a moment, if you'll remember, in Jesus' ministry, he was dealing with a guy named Nicodemus, and uh, and they were going to meet together late at night. Nicodemus didn't want anybody to know they were meeting. And Jesus did something very interesting because he was teaching Nicodemus that the movement of the Spirit is like the movement of the wind. He was drawing that parallel. In fact, John chapter 3 and verse number 8, quickly, I just want to share this passage with you. This is Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus said to him, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So Jesus draws the parallel, that's part of this wind. In fact, I don't know if you know this, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, I reached out to a friend of mine that's a Hebrew scholar and and, and helps in preparation for this. I don't speak Hebrew, but I know there are times where I need to get a little bit of help here, and so I reached out to a buddy of mine. Did you know that In the Hebrew, that would be the Old Testament scriptures, that's the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, uh, predominantly written in the Greek language. They use the same word in the Hebrew language for wind and the same word in the Greek language for spirit. It's very interesting to me. So in the Old Testament, the word is, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this word, and and I've, I've listened to it a number of times, um, ruach hakashish. I don't know if I butchered that or not, but I'm close to it. Um, it is literally the Hebrew word meaning spirit, the holy. And so the spirit, the Holy Spirit is ruach. The spirit, if you were to say, um, hey, there's a wind, if somebody in Jerusalem were to say, hey, there's a strong wind coming, they would use this word, ruhak. And it's the same word for wind and spirit. So you'll find in the Old Testament language, the Hebrew language, the same word is used for wind and spirit. And in the Greek language, same thing. In the Greek language, you've got the word, and I did study a couple of years of Greek, uh, you've got the word pneuma, or um, pneumatos, that is, in the Greek language, this is the same word used for breath or wind. So when you hear something like this, when they hear this audible phenomena, it is a, it, 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 whether it's in the Hebrew language, the Greek language, it is the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And there's a correlation being made that here comes the Holy Spirit. It got their attention. 
this audible phenomena, and then there was this visible phenomena. They, they look up and there are flaming tongues that appear. It, it looks like flaming tongues. And so what they see are literally um, divided tongues or flaming looking tongues. There's no heat that we know of. It's not burning them up. Uh, the l- writer Luke says, it looked like flames. It looked like tongues of fire. And you might go, oh, well, why fire, Pastor? Well, interesting that Uh, If you know your Bible, and I know many of you do know your Bible, uh, sometimes fire is used as a symbol of God's presence. You remember Moses. On a number of occasions, Moses experienced fire. Uh, You remember the day that he came around the backside of the mountain and there was this bush on fire? And the angel said to him, hey, Moses, take off your sandals because the ground you're walking on is holy and God communicates there with Moses in a burning bush, but it's not consumed. So we know in Acts chapter 2, as the Holy Spirit comes down on them, they're not consumed. Their their hair doesn't light up on fire. Their clothes don't get on fire. So there's not a heat or a flame associated with it. But Luke says it's like tongues of fire. It's, It's like a flaming tongue of fire. You'll remember when Moses went up on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, to get the law of God. Uh, you, you hear thunder and lightning and smoke and fire, the presence of God. Remember with Moses as well, when he's leading the people of Israel, when they, when they leave Egypt and they start into the journey towards the promised land, for 40 years in the wilderness, God leads them by fire at night. It is the presence of God. So what we've got here is um, on the birthday of the church, this is an atypical event taking place. Um, You're not going to find this replicated in Scripture. It's not replicated again. It's 120 people that are already followers, and they see and they hear something different. It is a phenomenon to them on this particular day, and everyone on that day is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, they're already believers. They already believe Jesus has been the Messiah and he has risen from the dead. They believe they have put their trust in him. But now on this day, these believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse number five. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, so not just the 120 in the upper room, people around Jerusalem heard that same rushing mighty wind. When they heard, verse 6, the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Well, who were the believers? The 120. Now, I've shared this with you before, and I think this is a good spot to just say it again, and I don't mean any disrespect to the folks that were from the Galilean region in the first century, but People around Jerusalem and from other parts that were Jewish, they viewed Galileans very differently. They kind of viewed them like we do today. Um, And again, I I don't mean this in a a harsh sense, but sometimes we view people in the southeast or maybe specifically like the state of Alabama. We, We kind of view them more country. Maybe we use terms like, boy, they are just hicks from out in the woods. Maybe they speak a little differently. Maybe they speak a little bit of hillbilly. Maybe if you're from West Virginia, you've got that hillbilly twang to you. That's how they viewed people that were from the Galilean region. They viewed them like hicks, like country bumpkins, like simpletons, like you're not educated, we are. You're not sophisticated, we are. So now Jews from all over have gathered in Jerusalem and they hear They hear this noise, this wind rushing through. They run to where this noise is being made, and there they find the 120, and they are praising God in specific dialect, in specific languages known to these people. So these different Jews that have come together, they're from different parts of the the known world at at that time, and now they're hearing praising God in their own language. What a day this was, man. Verse 7 says, they were talking about the people that rushed in to see. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. 
These people are all from Galilee. There it is. They, they just, they kind of look down on the Galilean people. Remember, majority of the, the disciples, 11 of the 12 disciples that have been chosen were from Galilee. The only one that wasn't? Judas Iscariot, who's, who has already gone and hung himself. So these are Galilean people. And they look at them and they're like, man, how can this be? These people are from Galilee. They're, they're unlearned. They're not educated. They are simpletons. And yet, we hear them speaking in our own language. How, how can this be? How can these simple people be speaking our language? They don't have education. They struggle to speak their own language. That's kind of how they feel about it. Here we are, they said, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, these are people from the island of Crete, Arabs, and we hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They're speaking in a language on the day of Pentecost that they've not spoken before, but now all of a sudden as the Holy Spirit has come upon them, they're able to communicate to all of these different people. Now, fast forward from the day of Pentecost. Let me, let me just fast forward with you for a moment. If we fast forward, and we're just going to, about three decades, about 30 years, maybe give or take 10 years, 30 to 40 years, you fast forward and the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Corinth. And it's, it's really kind of the profound New Testament passage on the gifts of speaking in tongues. He talks in chapter 12, chapter 13 about the gifts of the Spirit. But in chapter 14, he really takes more of a deep dive here and goes into depth about the gifts of the tongues. And Paul uses a word to describe tongues. And boy, this is a, this is a tough word here. Um, glas ale leha. It's a, it's a Greek word that he uses. And it, some of our church family and some of you maybe watching online, you might come from a Pentecostal background. This would be a word that maybe you're more familiar with. Um, but, but he uses a word that's very different than the language that is used and the word that is used for tongues in Acts chapter 2. As he's describing, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he's describing the gifts of tongues that are given to the church. It's very different. It's, in Acts 2, it's an understandable language. As all of these different Jewish folks rush in to hear what's going on, they hear the 120 praising God in their language. So it is a discernible language that they hear. So when the Holy Spirit comes on them, they speak in a language they themselves don't know, but those people hearing it knew it as their language. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's very different. As Paul is describing the gift of tongues, he uses a different word. It's an indescribable language. It, it's, um, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that when this happens and you speak in this language, that there should be um, the gift of somebody that is able to interpret the gift of interpretation of the tongue. So it's an indiscernible language that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now you might go, well, Pastor, why are you bringing this up? That was 30 or 40 years from the day of Pentecost. Well, the gifts of tongues were given to the early church on this particular day of Pentecost as they're praising God. I, I have heard and, and often heard it taught that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on them, that the only reason they were given this gift of tongues was so that they could communicate the gospel. Well, I can just tell you, they haven't communicated the gospel yet. It, that doesn't happen until verse number 14. That's when Peter stands up and preaches the gospel. This is just simply, they're in the room 10 days after the ascension of Christ, anticipating the coming of the Holy Spirit. He comes on them, they hear this loud rushing wind, then the Holy Spirit visibly, they see a descent on them. It looks like tongues of fire. And now they begin praising God is what the passage says. They are celebrating the goodness of God. They are excited. They are just sharing and they're doing it in a language that everybody that rushes in can understand. 
That's very different than what you find. So the way I grew up, this is different than what I heard growing up. As I have studied, as I have grown, as I have matured, they're not preaching the gospel at this point. All they're doing is simply praising God, and as they're praising God, non-believers show up, and they understand them. That's interesting to me. So as they speak in this other language, the non-believers are clearly able to understand them. And I think that is a distinct difference that we need to make sure we understand. Now, there are some similarities between the 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tongues and Acts 2 tongues. But again, Acts 2 is an atypical event. Uh, it's, it's a non-repeatable event. It's the birth of the church, and the church only has one birth date, and it was the day of Pentecost. So these tongues that they have, as they speak in a, in a, in a language they don't understand, it is a known language to those who ran to hear all of it. And, and it really was essentially to get the outsiders to come in and be able to understand. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, tongues are not used in that, in, in the sense Paul is talking about, they're not used for outsiders. Um, he, he's, Paul is saying that if anybody is gathering together, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he's saying when you gather together, the assembly, the church gathers together, if there's anybody unlearned, in other words, somebody that doesn't know Christ, they're a, a non-believer, they hear you speaking in a language that they don't understand, they're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think something has gone wrong with you and that this place is nuts. And so he, he is saying, that's not what this gift is for. So in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes on them. They speak in a tongue that they don't understand, but the people around them understand it in their language. Very different. In fact, Paul said, whoever speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak to man, but is speaking to God. Listen, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. He said, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking, talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will, it will all be mysterious. So I'm just showing you the difference as I understand it in Scripture, the differences between these two descriptions of types of tongues. Acts 2, Holy Spirit fell on them. They spoke in a tongue they didn't understand, but those unbelieving understood. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is saying, listen, if you've got this gift of tongues, you're speaking to God only. It's not for unbelievers because they, they won't understand you and they're going to think you're crazy. So the point is in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 11, the 120 spoke what Scripture said. They spoke about the wonderful things of God. What he has done. And I said it earlier, they weren't preaching the gospel. So that argument is no good here that, well, it was just so that they could advance the gospel. That's not what's going on. It says strictly, verse 11, they were speaking of the wonderful things that God has done and those who were non-believers understood them. So they're praising God for his wonderful things. Verse 12. They stood there, all of these people that have rushed over. Hey, what's going on? What's that noise? They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, Ah, oh, they're all drunk. You know, there are always going to be mockers when the activity and movement of God doesn't make sense to people. And these... People that have rushed in, some of them are going to begin mocking them like, oh, you had a little bit too much of that wine bottle. You probably spent too much time sitting at that bar stool. And it is amazing to me how these Galileans that they look down on are able to clearly articulate in their language the praises of God. I think this is fascinating. Uh, these guys never learned these languages, but in this moment, this atypical day of Pentecost, 50 days from the resurrection, they're able to communicate with non-believers in their language about the amazing activity of God. And these people are looking, like them, looking at them like, I, we don't get it. Uh, what is going on? This is mysterious to us. 
And so what do they do? They begin to mock. Isn't that kind of typical, though, of people when maybe they can't skillfully address something or maybe it doesn't logically make sense, maybe intellectually uh, they're unable to decipher what's going on. The first reaction sometimes is to just mock the person, make fun of the person, and, uh, and that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, in fact, I think this is a good place maybe we press pause. I, I'd love, I, I really came into today thinking, let's just go all the way through chapter 2, uh, but I think, I think this is good. I think let's stop right here with verse number 13. Uh, and then let's pick it up because verse 14, Peter's going to stand up and boldly preach the gospel. He's going to preach the first sermon in the church. The first sermon ever preached in the church happens on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. And so I just want to tell you that's the day that almost 3,000, it says about 3,000 people came to faith that day and believed in Jesus Christ. Now, here's how I wanted to wrap up. And again, I had hoped maybe we'd go all the way through chapter 2, but I think, I think this is good for today, and we can pick that up uh, later. One of the things that strikes me in these first 13 verses that I think is, in, is interesting for us today that I want to make application is, I see an interesting strategy for evangelism here. You notice that there were Jews from all over the region. In fact, I'm going to give you a map for all of you online. You're going to have a map that you can look at. There were Jews from Iran and Iraq that came. They were Jewish people that came to Jerusalem. They made the trip over. probably took them three or four days to get there. That's the reference to Mesopotamia, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates Valley region. They've come in. There's Jews that have returned for the 50th day from Passover, the Pentecost day. There's people from North Africa that are there mentions Egypt and Libya and Cyrene. These are North Africans. Uh, There's people as far as Rome or Asia Minor that have come to Jerusalem. I mean, a trip from Rome to Jerusalem probably was a week-long trip for people, and they've come in. So you've got this ethnically diverse group of people that hear this mighty rushing wind, and they immediately go to where it is, and there they see the believers speaking their language and praising God. They are able to hear this audible phenomenon just like the believers did. And it's in that day that many of them are going to get saved. And so, I, I, again, I've got, I've got an interesting theory here that I wanted to share with you and maybe a little bit of a strategy here because I believe that those non-believing Jews that came in and heard this and witnessed... Um, them praising God, and then again, Peter will stand up and preach the the gospel, and 3,000 people get saved. They're from all over the known world at that time. So they get saved. They clearly understood that Jesus died for their sins. He rose from the dead, and they embrace him. They go back to their homelands, and now they evangelize. So they go back and evangelize their families. They go back and evangelize their neighbors. They want everybody to know what they've witnessed, what they've seen, what they've heard, and they take it back. That that might explain why when Paul shows up in some of his missionary journeys to different cities, he shows up and there's already been a church established. There's already believers there. It could be that there were people that were there on the day of Pentecost that gave their life and faith to Jesus Christ as Peter preached the gospel. And so the strategy I'm proposing is, wherever your neighborhood is, we live in Central Florida. Central Florida is known to have the world moving here. I mean, we got a lot of people from different parts of the world here that have uh, resources as well as contacts in maybe different parts of the United States or different parts of this world. What if we just said, you know what, we're going to reach our neighbor? So I'm going to ask you the question, who's your one? Who is your one neighbor? Who is your neighbor across the street or the neighbor on your left or the neighbor on your right or the person right behind you, the person that you talk to, you wave to? Could we not, just like they did in the first century, it was they began praising God. They were celebrating the goodness of God. Could it be that our neighbors, our classmates, our teammates, those coworkers around us don't see enough of the activity and praise of God in our own lives 
Maybe, maybe part of this strategy is you start celebrating. Maybe if you're going to listen to music, listen to good worship music, man. Download the Spotify account from the fellowship and listen to the worship music from the fellowship. We're going to have Maverick City and Elevation and Passion and Young and Free. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of great music. You could celebrate and worship him and that begins to share a testimony. Talk about the goodness and the greatness of God. Share with your neighbors. Uh, invite them over for a meal as you're sitting uh, around a card table playing games, whether you're in a pool with them or playing ball with somebody. Share with them the goodness of what God's doing in your church life and what God's doing in your life. And may God use that to draw them in and then be attracted to the life of a believer because of the goodness. That's what the 120 did. They're praising God for all the good things he has done and the non-believers hear it and they are drawn in and then Peter shares the message. So may we take that same strategy. I, I'm just going to pray and I've been praying. I have wrestled, I've studied, I've prepared for this sermon and to close it out, I thought, okay, what is the best way for us to do this? Maybe by the end of this week, we would just get serious individually, corporately as a church, but individually. We would get serious and say, I'm going to start developing the relationships with people, my neighbors, my classmates, my teammates, my coworkers. I'm going to develop relationships with them. I'm going to start drawing attention to Jesus Christ through my actions, the way I praise him, the way I sing, the way I talk. You may just want to download the app Three Circles. It's Life on Mission or the Three Circles. It's the same app. It's put out by the North American Mission Board. It's a simple plan for how to share the gospel with a lost person. You don't have to have a seminary degree to share the gospel. You just have to have Jesus in you. Have the Holy Spirit in you. If you've been converted to Christianity, if you've repented of sin and you've believed in Jesus Christ and given your life to Him, then you have a story to share. We call it a grace story. So could we not just start sharing our grace story and may this start to reap an incredible harvest that lost people would start to see the people of the fellowship, the people of this expression, excited about the, the God things that have been done. And may we see our, our reach, our footprint grow and expand. May, may our auditorium fill. May We're talking about starting a second service in October of this year because we have no room left in this room. Now, you felt the experience of that. And so, listen, Let's go reach lost people. Let's not just go after people that already have a church home. Let's go after people that are not connected to Christ and begin sharing with them of the goodness of Jesus in our lives and in our church life. So today, I would ask, who's your one? Who would you start praying for? Maybe it's going to be three or four people. Maybe it's a dozen people. But start with one. Start praying and start investing. And don't just spend months praying. God's going to give you opportunities now to start sharing and start building that relationship. So Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13, I pray that you have heard the word of God today. You've been blessed as you've listened to the word of God being taught today. Father, we thank you in this place for your word. We thank you for what you teach us. And God, I pray that we would be full of the Holy Spirit, empowered and emboldened to share about the goodness of you and as opportunity comes to share our story of your goodness in our lives by telling them our great story of coming to faith in you. And we'll ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. To all of you that have been a part of our online gathering, thank you for being here today. And we just want you to know about the awesome love of God. And I, I want you to hear it. If you've not heard it in a while, God loves you. He loves you deeply. He loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. If you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, then why don't we take that same message and start to expand our territory? Let's reach out to our neighbors and our classmates, our coworkers, our friends, our family, our network, our places where we can influence people by sharing the good news of Jesus. And it might just start with praising God. It may be just listening to good Christian music and then sharing it with somebody that you know. And they're like, hey, what kind of music you listen to? And you tell them, and then it leads to a conversation that could potentially lead to a gospel conversation. And so I'm on a mission, and I'm so glad that the Fellowship Church, you are on the mission with me. Let's reach every man, woman, and child to give them a repeated opportunity to see, hear, and respond 
to the good news of Jesus Christ. So thanks for being here today. For all of you that uh, financially support us, thank you. You are providing a pathway for us to get the gospel out, but let's also take the gospel. Let's not just give financially. Let's do both. Let's give financially and share verbally. So thank you for your support. Would you continue to pray that God gives us an explosive 2022 of reaching lost people? Hey, have a great week. Go and win this week. Tell somebody about Jesus. Be excited about what he's done in your life. I'll see you next week.